We begin by praising Allah. We praise Him. We seek His help. And we ask for His forgiveness. And we take refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, no one can misguide. But whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, no one can guide. And I testify that Allah alone is worthy of worship and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and his messenger. Why would somebody be an atheist? Why would somebody choose a belief system that declares there is no creator of this universe? And this is the first point that I want to make to all of you. That atheism is a truth claim. Atheism is a truth claim. In other words, atheists are taking a position about something. An agnostic is someone who says, I don't know whether there's a God or not. An agnostic is someone who says, maybe there's a God, maybe there's not a God, I don't know. The evidence is not convincing to me either way. But an atheist is different. An atheist declares that God does not exist. The atheist declares that he or she knows. That's the implication. They know that God does not exist. And what I want to examine is what is the basis of this knowledge? What is the basis of this claim? When an atheist is claiming that God does not exist or they know that God exists or they are convinced that God does not exist, what leads them, what makes them adopt this claim? What makes them take this position? Now, my good friend, and colleague Hamza Sotsis, we call him the Muslim Aristotle. We call him that, mashallah, not just because he's Greek originally, he's Greek and he's a convert to Islam, but also he is very knowledgeable in the field of philosophy. And he has done many debates with atheists, leading atheists in the world, including, for example, Ed Buckner, who is the head of the Humanist and Atheist Society in the United States of America, Dan Barker, who is a former Christian evangelical, who's turned his evangelism now to atheism, and many others that Hamza has debated, both publicly and you can see these debates if you want to go to our website, our iERA website, you can follow the links to those debates and watch them if this is a topic that interests you. What Hamza concluded, and it's similar to what I have concluded after many, many years of giving dawah, that most people who are atheists are not atheists because their belief is rational. No. And all you have to do, my dear brothers and sisters, is watch some of Hamza's debates with these leading atheists in the world. And believe me, you will be disappointed. You will be very disappointed. Not with Hamza, alhamdulillah. But you'll be disappointed because atheists have somehow managed to convince many people that atheism is a type of rational choice. 
It's the default position of the scientist and the academic and the intellectual. So a lot of people today imagine that most scientists are atheists. And this alone, just this, makes people sit up and take the claim of atheism seriously. Even myself, in my many years as a Muslim, my mashallah, probably now 25 years, alhamdulillah, as a Muslim, I've been a Muslim now longer than I was a non-Muslim. I have thought about this subject a lot. How can we prove the existence of Allah? Examining the arguments of the atheists. But as the title of today's talk suggests, I have concluded there is a type of deceit going on. That their claim to be rational and intellectual is by and large a false claim. I would conclude, and Hamza has concluded, that most atheists are atheists because of emotional reasons, not because of rational reasons. Their position is an emotional position, not a rational one. And I think that the two most obvious reasons for a person to be an atheist, and there are others, there are other reasons, but the two most apparent reasons for a person to be an atheist is number one, the person feels that God has let them down. And this is what both me and my colleague Hamza, through experience we have found, that a lot of people, and this is often people who are formerly religious, become atheist because they feel that God has let them down. I used to pray, they would say. I used to be religious. I used to believe in God. But then such and such thing happened to be in my life. Such and such difficulty came to me in my life. How could God do that to me? I used to pray, they would say. I used to be religious. I used to believe in God. But then such and such thing happened to be in my life. Such and such difficulty came to me in my life. How could God do that to me? How could God sit there and let me face this difficulty? He should have rescued me. He should have saved me. He should have taken me away from this. In other words, they experience some difficulty in their life and they feel that, perhaps they feel they are so special that God should have looked after them. And this itself, of course, comes from a wrong concept of God and a wrong concept of our relationship with God. As we Muslims know, life is a test. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الْغَفُورُ In the Qur'an, the Creator, Allah, the Creator, is telling us that I have created life and I have created death, or I have created death, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ I have not created death and life except to test, except to see which of you is best in conduct? And he is Aziz, he is the mighty, and he is Ghafoor, he is the forgiving. So life is a test. The nature of the test is that there will be hardship and there will be ease. There will be difficulties, there will be hardships. There will be illnesses, there will be sicknesses. Indeed, in the Qur'an, Allah is telling us, do you think that I would leave you saying you believe without testing you as we tested those who came before you? So we will be tested. And the fact that we claim to be believers in God 
does not mean we will stop being tested. No. In fact, we know from the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Allah tests the ones he loves. And the ones he loves the most, he tests them the most. Because it is through this process of being tested that we as human beings become refined. That is how we learn to improve. That is how we become better. That is how our character and our personality and our disposition, if we are patient, if we see the test through, then we become better human beings. It is like the process of purifying the ore of a metal. In order to get the pure metal, you have to purify the ore. You have to extract the pure metal from the dirt and from the ore that surrounds it. And through this process, the purification takes place. So a lot of atheists have this problem that if there is a God, how come he let this happen to me? But this is not rational. It's not rational. This is emotional. It's emotional. If you think about it. And what I will do is go through the rational arguments of God's existence. And we will see that there are very, very strong rational arguments. Very good reasons to believe that this universe has a creator. And then we will examine, insha'Allah, some of the arguments of the atheists, and we will also find out that their arguments are not strong arguments at all. But I gave one reason. So the first reason why, out of the two major reasons that a person becomes an atheist, and notice I say, becomes an atheist. Because the first topic I want to discuss, a very interesting topic, is that believing in God is actually natural and instinctive for human beings. So becoming an atheist is a decision that a person takes. Human beings are naturally born believing in the Creator. It's our environment and circumstances that take us away from that. Atheism is an acquired position. It's not a natural one. It's unnatural. The second reason, the second reason why people become atheists is because they simply don't like the idea of having to live by rules other than the rules they make for themselves they don't like the idea that they are going to be held accountable they don't like the idea that there are some things a human being should do and some things a human being should not do and that the only being that has the right and the knowledge to tell human beings that is the creator in other words, what attracts the atheist is what they imagine to be freedom. I say they imagine it to be freedom. And with this, there are many other reasons as well. There are some historical reasons, especially for scientists. The conflict between the Roman Catholic Church and science has for many scientists marred the position of religion vis-a-vis -vis science. And you particularly think of the way that Galileo was treated. And for many scientists, this has meant that the church, which for them, the Catholic Church, represents religion, is against science. And that the church has not given scientists the freedom to explore and to develop different theories. And I think, by the way, brothers and sisters, as Muslims, that should be, as a side point, a cautionary tale for us. Because, of course, in our civilization, 
We have not had that conflict between science and religion. In our civilization, in fact, we find that science was promoted. Science was encouraged. Indeed, according to some Western scholars and intellectuals, the scientific process itself, what we call the scientific methodology, was something the Muslims invented and the Muslims introduced. And people in the West learned that process from the Muslims. So I think it's important that we as Muslims are very cautious about creating or exaggerating a conflict between religion and science. But of course, if the scientific community is going to decide to take atheism as its position of choice, it's going to become very hard to avoid such a conflict. But I think the reality is that, first of all, the claim that most scientists are atheists is not true. It is simply not true. In fact, if you look at some of the greatest minds in science, like Albert Einstein, it is very clear from reading Albert Einstein that he believed in the existence of a creator. Newton, of course, who is famous in many ways, he's one of the giants of science, also believed in the existence of a creator. And interestingly enough, for many years of Darwin's life, he also believed that there was a God. It's only towards the end that it seemed that he expressed doubts about that. So this claim that the scientific community is an atheist community is not really a true claim at all. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, what I want to do is I want to go through some of the arguments that are put forward by people who believe that the Creator exists. And I want to introduce a set of arguments or a direction of discussion that is quite new. And the reason I want to introduce this is that there has been a very major piece of research done recently in Oxford uh, by the Society for Mind and Anthropology, or Anthropology and Mind, who did a 1.9 million pounds they spent on this research. As far as I remember, there were over 60 academics involved in this research from all over the world. So this was a major piece of scientific research in the realm of human psychology and anthropology. And after many years, they concluded that the belief in God, the religious belief and the belief in afterlife is not something that is taught by our parents. It is something instinctive and natural in the human being. That in fact, the very human thought process itself is shaped by religious values. This is very significant. Because of course, this agrees with exactly what Islam has been saying that every human being is born upon the fitrah. In other words, every human being, as the Prophet Muhammad wasallam said, is naturally inclined to worship God alone. And as the Prophet wasallam said, it is only our parents that make us diverge away from that natural inclination to single out God for worship and make us followers of different religions or no religion at all. So this is the nature of the human being. And it's interesting that this very extensive piece of research has confirmed that. And we all have instincts. Animals, by the way, operate on instinct. What makes the human being different from the animal is that the human being has reason. We have the ability to reason, whereas animals they rely upon instincts. And we have also what we call reflex action. So, for example, 
If I pick up something that is hot, mashallah, not Quran, but something that is very hot, I don't have to think. There's no process in my brain saying, this is very hot, I must drop it. No. You do it instinctively. You drop it instinctively. This is a reflex action. This is something that is not rational. This is just something that is part of our intrinsic makeup. In order to keep on holding something hot, you have to train yourself. You have to learn to bypass your normal instinctive, which a human being can do. We can learn to bypass those reflex actions and force ourselves to hold a hot coal. This is unique to human beings. Consciousness. That ability to use our mind to override our instinctive reactions. However, this instinct is there. And the belief in God is instinctive. What is the proof? What is the proof of this? It's very interesting that one of the, what we could call the high priests of atheism, Richard Dawkins, was recently on a a TV show, and he was being interviewed. And that he was saying in this interview, you know, most Christians, they don't know anything about their Bible. They just don't know about their book. So the interviewer said, okay, that's interesting. You believe, Mr. Dawkins, you're a big fan of Darwin, aren't you? Of course, yes, Darwin's very important. Um, could you tell me the full title of his book, The Origin of the Species? And Richard Dawkins started going, um... Uh, mm. Oh, God. He said, he said, oh, God. So he found that this atheist or this renowned atheist is being put in a difficult situation. He doesn't know the answer, and he ends up going, oh, God. Like, oh, God, help me. What am I going to say? And this is a guy who says he doesn't believe in God. And actually, this is instinctive. This is instinctive. Allah gives the example in the Qur'an. Allah gives the example in the Qur'an of those people who go on a boat. And they go on the boat expecting to do trade and expecting to buy and sell. They go onto this boat and when they go out to sea, there is a great storm. And Allah describes in the Qur'an how the waves are coming over them like the roof of a tent. Can you imagine? Huge waves crashing down on top of you. Now, for a bit, the human being will think, okay, the boat is going to save me. The boat is well built. The boat will save me. Or maybe they think the captain will save me. But when the boat starts to disintegrate, to break apart, and the captain gets washed over shore, what do they do? What do they do? They start calling upon the Creator. They start saying, oh God, help me. And when they say, oh God, it is not the point, the name is not important. Whether they say God or Allah or uh, Huda or whatever. No, the name is not important. It's the concept that is important. What are they calling to conceptually? Conceptually, in their minds, they are calling upon the being which they know instinctively has power over everything in the universe. That's the one that they are calling to. They know that a being exists instinctively that can rescue them and has the power and the ability to save them from their difficulty. This is the point. Not the name, but the point is the concept. And this is important. Because this being they are calling upon instinctively is not part of the universe. They are not calling upon something that is part of the universe. Nor is this being the universe collected together entirely. No. This is a being they know is distinct and separate from the universe who has power over it. 
This, of course, is Allah. This, of course, is the Creator. So this instinctive knowledge, which is major scientific survey now, has found is an intrinsic part of our thought process as human beings. So this is very important because actually we could almost finish there. We could say to any atheist, you know there's a God. You know it. It's in your nature. Every single one of you knows it. And actually this is the reality. Children are dying, women are dying, there are earthquakes, there is disease. Where is this God? How can he let it happen? However, we soon realize with a bit of thinking that this is not a rational argument. This is an emotional argument. It's based upon emotion. Because the reasons for believing that the universe has a creator are clear. We live in an organized, systemized universe where we see organization, where we see systems. It's rational to conclude that there is power and will and intelligence behind it. So the existence of suffering has got nothing to do with whether there is a creator or not. It's a different question. Actually, the question is, why does God let these things happen? It doesn't prove or it doesn't say anything about whether God exists or not. But it is a question of why. And the only way we can answer that question, why, is when God tells us. In fact, this very question itself leads the rational mind to conclude that we need revelation. We need God to tell us why is our life the way it is? What is the purpose of our life? What is the reason of our existence? So it's very interesting that the very question of evil and suffering in the world is a question that should lead us to believe not only that there is a God, because the issue has got nothing to do with whether the Creator exists, but it's an issue to do with why. Oh God, why? Why do you let these things happen? The only way we can know is if God has revealed that guidance to us. And that is a very, very powerful argument for the need for revelation for the need for God to give this guidance to us. But anyway, inshallah, maybe we can cover some of the rest of the stuff in the question and answer session. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Abdurrahim Green. So now we have come to the time for the question and answer session. As always, we have a mic to the left for the brothers and one in the rear for the sisters. Go ahead, sister. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum um, My question is just related to what the brothers asked. We know all that God is just, and no unjust will happen to any person. But when I talk to my atheist friends online and in person, their questions that I cannot answer is where is the just? When I become Muslim, and everything is easy because I was born in this side of the world, or I was born in this family. I know you just answered that about the people who was born in atheist family and such, but the question is, what should I tell them ex precisely? If I tell them that God is just, and they will be answered in the judgment day, they'd be their answer is, I don't believe in God, and I don't believe of the judgment day. So my answer is invalid to them, or it doesn't give them what they want to know. Well, I think, first of all, sister, to me, the answer in some ways is quite obvious. Because you are talking to those people. Therefore, you are giving them the opportunity to change and to accept the truth. How then can they complain about the message not reaching them when you are the messenger bringing the message to them, right? And, and this is the thing I really have to say. I hate to generalize about a group of people. There are some atheists who are maybe genuinely confused people, right? But honestly, many of them are very arrogant people. When you begin to discuss with them, you see it. 
You will give them very reasonable answers and they come with very unreasonable replies. And these are the people who are claiming that they are reasonable. I would also recommend, highly recommend, you give to your atheist friends you're talking to online. Just ask them to read this book, The Man in the Red Underpants. Ask them to read it and see if they can come to a response to what is in it. And you should read it yourself, inshallah. You will find it very, very helpful because the beginning of the book is talking exactly about the issues to do with how do we know and how can we be convinced that God exists. The other point I want to point out, sister, is again the point of fitrah. We believe that every human being has an instinctive knowledge. Everybody. Atheism is an acquired position. And this study done by the Oxford Institute for Anthropology and Psychology, 1.9 million pounds they spent. 60 academics across the world. They did this including China, including countries that are largely, they don't believe in God. What did they do is when they examined children and they questioned them and they gave them certain tests, in fact, what did they find? They did have a concept of God and they did have a concept of the afterlife. So even in these atheistic societies, children still had this basic natural concept. And this is some of the reasons why they concluded that the belief in God and the belief in religion and the belief in afterlife is actually a natural instinctive belief in the human being, right? So you find, as I said, I think the main reasons why a person chooses to be an atheist is because something bad happened to them in their life and they think, you know, how could God let this happen to me? Or they just don't want to live their life by some rules. That's it. They don't want rules in their life. They just want to be able to do whatever they want without feeling that there's some accountability. There may be other reasons, and some people are genuinely confused about, for example, the problem of evil. Another thing that often they say is religion has led to so many wars. You see, religion has led to so many wars. How can religion be true when religion has led to so many wars and so many problems? Anyway, the point comes again. Is this a rational argument? Think about it. Is this a rational argument? No, it's not rational. Because you could still conclude, I'm not saying this is the case. I'm not saying this is the case. But rationally, you could say, well, maybe God likes wars. It doesn't prove there's not a God. It doesn't even prove whether a religion is true or not. What is the basis for them to say, because religion causes wars, it can't be true? What's the basis? It's not a rational basis. It's emotional. It's just an emotional appeal. It's not rational. And anyway, it's not true. 